Good day, Paul. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Happy to do it. Excellent. Um, first of all, uh, before we get into this, can you give us, can you introduce yourself and let's start off with uh, where did you go to school and what did you study? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm Paul Harmon. Uh, I grew up in Indiana. Uh, I went to school at Earlham College, which is a small college in Indiana. Uh, I studied biology. Uh, I had one of those careers where I studied biology and then decided I wanted to be a psychologist and took a year off for psychology at uh, an institute for psychiatric research. And then I decided I wanted to be a philosopher. And then I decided I wanted to graduate from college more than anything else. And I went back and majored in biology and graduated with the minimum credits in biology required. So uh, sort of mixed. Um, I see. So uh, t let's go into your uh, the jobs that you've had and your career progression. Uh, so what did you do after college? Um, as soon as I left college, I went to work for a job corps center. This was the 60s, and this was Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. And so the job corps center was, going, was taking youth who uh, had dropped out of high school and was trying to give them some additional training. Uh, I went thinking I'd teach science, and in fact, uh, we decided that the it was much better to focus on vocational skills. And so I ended up teaching English and math in conjunction with the landscape nursery program. Uh, but after a reasonably short time, I, I ended up doing a, developing some curriculum just for myself. Uh, and it, that got the attention of the people running the, the center. And like most big companies at the time, they'd taken over the center because they wanted to get involved in educational technology. So they, they asked me to take a couple of classes to help with curriculum development. Uh, and the first class I took was at the University of Michigan, and it was Gary Rumler's programmed instruction course. Uh, I met Gary there. I came back to the Job Corps Center. I proceeded to develop two or three pieces of program instruction. Uh, one on how to trim roses, for example. Um, and it certainly was wonderful from my point of view because of program instruction. At the Job Corps Center, all the students were, it was, it was much freer than any regular educational environment would be. I could write the materials and I could go out and test it with two or three students. And I'd go through each one. Each one would go through the materials and have, I could see where they had problems. I would revise the materials. And so I would start out writing something on, say, how to trim roses. And it would have, say, 25 frames. That would be the whole thing, 25 sentences and questions. Um, I would find out that many of the students couldn't figure out what I meant. And so I would re rearrange the sentences and I would add more. And I would end up with a, a programmed instructional piece that had say 50 frames. Um, that probably bored the heck out of some of the brighter students, but it would get, the, it would get all the students, it would get 90% of the students through the materials answering all the questions more or less correctly. It certainly taught me that you write something down that you, you think everybody will understand and they don't. Um, you have to think actually several, a while to figure out why in the world somebody else can't read this sentence and get out of it what you could. Uh, and then you end up writing additional sentences to try to elaborate. Um, it taught me to, to think and write much clearer than I had when I graduated from college, or at least more fundamentally. Uh, somewhere along the line at the Job Corps Center, um, I guess this is going to be your next question, what's my next job? Somewhere along the line at the Job Corps Center, people from New York, from Basic Systems, came because they were doing an evaluation for the Federal Job Corps Center, the federal government. 
they came and asked questions and in the process of my showing them around the campus and talking to them, uh, they decided that I, they'd like to hire me to come to New York to work for basic systems. Uh, so after two or three years at the Job Corps Center, I moved to New York to basic systems. If you wrote a book on the history of program instruction, basic systems would be right up there. Right after B.F. Skinner came up with the idea of program instruction, uh, a group of bright doctoral students from Columbia University set up what they called basic systems, and it was going to write program instruction, and it did. It wrote some very impressive program instruction. Uh, when I moved to New York, basic systems had just been bought by Xerox. Uh, and so it became basic systems, a subsidiary of Xerox, and then it became Xerox Learning Systems, which it is today. Um, they weren't doing very much program instruction when I arrived in New York. They had, they had sort of started because of Xerox was a much bigger corporation. They had moved on from just doing program instruction to uh, much larger evaluation projects, which they did for the federal government. And so my particular role was, was there was uh, studying uh, Job Corps curriculum and trying to consolidate it. What they've done is launched 20 Job Corps centers around the country, and each of them had a program, for example, in cooking skills. And each, several of them had landscape nursery skills. And each of those would develop their own curriculum. And so then now what they wanted to do was to pull that back together and say, what are the learning objectives that the students are accomplishing? So I spent two years, a lot of fun, going from one subject to another, from landscape nursery to cooking to auto mechanics to so forth. And each time we'd bring together the lead instructors from all these camps for a meeting, and they'd submit things in advance. I would develop a, an outline of what I thought they were teaching. They would argue about it because everybody liked their own words. Um, we would consolidate it and come up with a common uh, set of objectives and steps so that the, the Federal Job Corps Center could evaluate what was done at each one of the individual Job Corps Centers. Um, any case, I kept that up. I kept that at that until, um, well, basically Xerox decided to to mod to change what they were doing at Basic Systems. Uh, the group that I was with was was closed down, but it didn't make any difference because we had federal contracts, and so a new company was set up, Cyburn, which was going to run just those contracts. So we continued to do the work for the Job Corps Center because the contract ran for another year and a half. Uh, but that was enough to start me looking for another job. Um, should I go on? Next yeah, job. so what year was this? What years were you at the job? Oh, what year? I was at Xerox from say 66, 67, 68. Um, the, Job. In any case, I noticed somewhere I had I had become involved in NSPI. I don't know what meeting I went to. It was a meeting. It, the first meeting I went to was at San Antonio. That was not the, the NSPI's first ever meeting was San Antonio. But yes. then they came, they came back. And I don't know when it was, five years later or 10 years later. But whenever they came back, that was the, meet, the first meeting I attended uh, and started meeting there. So I that was the first professional affiliation that I ever felt. I mean, when I left college, I thought of myself as a biologist, and then I did odds and ends as teaching and writing curriculum, but I didn't think of that as a career. Uh, with NSPI, briefly, I thought of myself as at least a behaviorist and maybe a program instruction writer. Um, I met several people at Basic Systems that were well-known in programs, people like Kathy Spies and Stuart Margulies, people who had written well-known programs and uh, program instruction. Um, in any case, I saw somewhere that Gary Rumler had joined with a guy in New York called Tom Gilbert, 
and that the two of them were setting up a company called Praxis in New York. So I sent my resume to those guys. Um, I interviewed, they hired me. So Tom had had a business already and he had two or three people working for him. When Gary came, the business got larger. Um, I mean, if we're talking history of program instruction, Basic Systems was the first program instruction company that sold big. They, they sold to Xerox. Uh, they made a lot of money. Um, they became a case study at Harvard because when Xerox bought Basic Systems, it was very early in the mergers game. They bought Basic Systems and they didn't think to put any constraints on the people who were getting all the money at Basic Systems. And so they all immediately left. And it became famous in New York. You know, this guy went and did this. This guy opened his own private zoo. Uh, this guy went off to the Himalayas to study with a guru. And the Harvard Business School ended up trying to teach business people, don't, if you buy a company, lock them in. You know, or just make them work for 10 years to get stock or something. But don't let them all walk out the door or you'll end up with a company with none of the people who made it. So that was learned from basic systems. Uh, one of the guys who made a lot of money in that deal was a guy named Marty Mensch. And Marty, having made a lot of money in educational technology, wanted to do it again. And so the third, the silent partner at, at Praxis was Marty. So Marty, Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert. Somehow Marty put this together because he thought it would be another winning combination. Um, I worked at Praxis for three years. Um, we went through a lot of different changes. I ended up learning a lot about how to write proposals and contracts um, from one of the guys there and ended up doing a lot of that. Uh, I ended up managing things. Tom and Gary were very different people. Uh, they were both very bright guys in their own way. Uh, Tom was very much in the theory of, of performance. Gary Romer was very much in the actually getting people to change their performance in business uh, sense. Most of our contracts at Praxis were, were things what, what, what later, much later in my life I would call uh, business processes. Uh, an insurance company had salespeople and they had a sales process and the people were expected to sell insurance policies and they weren't doing it and so the question would they would come to us and say fix it you know uh, our, our our competitor is selling twice as many insurance policies as we are per month do something about that so when we were asked to solve a problem it wasn't program instruction anymore it was some sort of behavior modification or, or performance modification uh, people in business don't really like the word uh, behavior as much as they like performance, I think. So in any case, uh, we, mostly our, the contracts that we were doing the, when I worked with Gary were going into a company, figuring out what the problem was. We had some classic program things. The, uh, the Army hired us for a nuclear blast program where you know, companies were expected to, or officers in the military were expected to assure that their bases could withstand a nuclear blast. So we developed program instruction, which they would go through, which basically walked them through what they needed to do to assure that their base, I mean, they couldn't withstand a, a, a direct hit. It was, it was a third degree hit. So, you know, how, how strong do the buildings have to be and, and so forth to do this? So that would, would be a matter of, of interviewing the experts and building uh, a, a structure, piece of instructional material that they would use. Uh, we did a lot of classes where that was really Gary's forte. I mean, teaching people about instructional materials and, and uh, performance and changing things. Tom was off on his own doing theoretical things, whatever appealed to him. Uh, he wrote a paper I mean, he, he was into methetics at the time, and I, I don't even want to go there, but it, at the time it seemed, well, having studied a lot of behavior, and, and I, 
I started on a PhD program at Columbia at this point. And so I was doing some psychology classes on the side at, at night school, basically. But coming from a behavioral point of view, I couldn't figure out where Tom was coming from. I mean, he said, we got to have propedeutics, and then we got to have this, and then we got to have that. And you'd say, why? And he'd say, well, it's just obvious. It's just obvious you got to have these things. Um, and so that it left me confused, but I, you know, I finally took the ass and I became a, a believer in methetics and the whole system. You gotta, if you're gonna lay out program instruction, you, you can't just start kids off and split it with one sentence after another, which is what the classic program instruction did. I mean, the, the thing wrong with program instruction or not wrong, but the, the key to it was that Skinner went to classes that his kids had when they were in grade school. And he basically said, let's, they're, they're trying to learn math. And so let's teach it very systematically one step at a time. And each step they take, we'll test. That's what the program was about. We'll test, see if they did it right. The question really is, what is a step? That's a theory medical question. In other words, are we talking 10 words? Skinner guessed 15 words. Why 15? Why not 50? Why not 150? And does it make any difference that the kid he was focusing on was a seven or eight year old and the person we're focusing on is a 40 year old who has advanced degrees? <laughs> I mean, so the whole question about step size and programming was really the beginning of the end for program instruction. And instead of, I mean, there had been Susan Meyer Markle's book, Good Step, Good Frames and Bad. The idea of a step size, a frame in program instruction, just, it, it broke down because we had so many audiences and different audiences could move at different paces. And many audiences got very bored if you gave them a sentence and asked them a question and then another sentence and another question. So. What Tom was trying to do basically was to build a lesson plan that would define some words, give them a model that showed them how the words worked with each other, a, a basic overview, and then try to teach them how to do something using the model. Um, and it was, he, he never solved the problem of what a, what a step was or what a frame had to be. But he at least understood that with adults, it was going to be a pretty big thing and it had a lot of complexity to it. And he tried to build a system that had the flexibility of handling that. He also wrote a paper somewhere along the line about how kids should learn, how kids should learn social science as part of their curriculum and how that should be done. And one of the big publishers in New York, I forget which one, bought the idea. You know, Tom Gilbert came up with this idea of we'll, we'll teach social studies to all the kids in grade school and told Praxis, you know, show us how to do this, build this. And what, what had been a theoretical idea with Tom suddenly became very practical and huge. And, you know, Gary sort of turned that over to me and I ended up going to Columbia and hiring a sociologist that, uh, I mean, the grad students sociologists and psychologists and anthropologists that had all, each of them coming into meetings every week to sort of write rules. And we were going to sequence the rules that if we would teach a kid about economics and, and anthropology and sociology to build a curriculum. And, you know, we were just at the beginning of that when I left Praxis. But I mean, that if it had actually gone, if they'd done it, I, they didn't, they dropped it. But if they had gone on, it would have been, well, basic systems build a program in science, basic science and math. And it was huge. I mean, they had wall charts covered whole walls about what, what was going to be taught next and what the, how the sequence would build up. And they were doing experiments. So they would have simple experiment with water and, and another experiment with papers and sticks. And all this would build into theories of levers and so forth. Um, and so this was essentially what we were playing with at Praxis very briefly, but it was so different than 
uh, trying to teach insurance people how to sell insurance. And so the praxis became this very diffuse group of people going in different directions. And Tom, and basically Tom going in one direction, Gary going in another, uh, Marty trying to worry about where, how we were going to make money. Um, so you left there after three years. What, what, so when was that, that you left? I left there in 71. 71. Uh, Kathy Speed, who was a, had a doctorate from Columbia and had hired me at Basic System. She hired me just before she left. I mean, I was hired at Basic System. I showed up for my first day of a job in New York, all bright and shiny. Well, first of all, I showed up at 8 o'clock. And Xerox didn't, and basic systems didn't open until nine or nine fifteen, something like that. I finally got in. Uh, they showed me where Kathy's desk was, and said, "You know, just sit here, wait. She'll she'll come in." She never came in all day. She didn't come in the next day. Um, for two or three days, I just sat there. And then they decided they were going to assign me to somebody else, and told me that Kathy had resigned and gone off to be a consultant somewhere else. This was the breakup of basic systems. Uh, and I it got signed to the guy who took over the Job Corps contract, a guy named Bill Laidlaw. Um, when I, let's see. In any case, Kathy later on consulted with a group from New Mexico who were setting up a new company in San Francisco, ILS, Independent Learning System. Uh, Basically, it was set up by Don Toasty um, and Jim Evans and Lloyd Homme. Um, the world of behaviorism, when I was at Basic Systems and Praxis, was divided between program instruction, which was written materials that would walk the person through something that were focused on knowledge and motivation, which was focused on how do we get the student to want to learn. And I can remember at, at the first ISPI meeting, trying to hire somebody from the Albuquerque Westinghouse labs that Don Toasty headed because they were, I listened to the papers they were giving, and they had these wonderful studies where they would have two rooms, and the kid was in one room, and he would work on some uh, instructional material. And then as soon as he was done, he could run into the next room and play with a toy for 15 minutes. And then he had to come back, and he did some more instructional material. And then he ran back and did, played with the toy some more. And they had different things he could play with, so he got to choose. Uh, they got wonderful, you could see these wonderful videos, uh, film, I guess, at the time, of the kids running back and forth doing these projects. And I would mention this to Tom Gilbert. I would say, you know, we ought to get one of these guys. We ought to incorporate this. And Tom said no. It was, he was totally uninterested in motivation. He was saying motivation, he, in fact, he'd said in the Journal of Methodics, there's a famous quote, motivation is a constant. We all know motivation isn't the constant, right? So basically, the New York school, if you would, was totally focused on instruction, program instruction and learning materials, um, which is where all the publishers were, which made some sort of sense. Uh, Jim Evans and Lloyd Homme had originally focused on instruction, program instruction. They'd set up Evco, a company in Albuquerque, to develop program instruction. In fact, they developed a lot of it. Uh, when program instruction started to sort of fade, and that was in the late 60s, um, the Don Toasty, who had worked with them, set up, took over the labs at Westinghouse, just like Xerox had its basic systems, Westinghouse set up its, its labs. And Don ended up focusing a lot on motivation. And then he incorporated Lloyd and, and, and uh, Jim in that. So they had a whole group of people that were very focused. Westinghouse had its own ideas about where they should go and what their limits were. And so in 1971, Don cut a deal with, I'm blocking on his name, but a, a, business, a senior business executive 
and they set up ILS. And ILS was going to offer instructional materials to college students. And so Don ended up hiring Kathy. Kathy ended up recommending me. Don ended up hiring me. I moved to San Rafael. Um, and we ended up writing, I don't know, 15 courses for colleges. Um, in my particular case, I wrote the course. I had a group of people, actually. I had about six people working for me. Uh, I, we wrote the course for English. We wrote the course for um, uh, ecology. And we wrote a course on basic reasoning skills. So each of the... And, each of those courses were, were designed, again, for, for basic college. So if you say English, and then you look at what people actually do in their first course in English, it's mostly learning, a, reading, reading some parts of books and then writing a paper on them. And so we wrote a course on basically how to write papers on, how to write an essay on a block of material. Um, any case, it, it was... It was a lot of fun. We were prepared to go on and do it forever. The principal guy who had funded it got a divorce from his wife and gave her the ILS because he didn't think it was going anywhere fast enough. And we went bankrupt. Uh, so that was like 73. And actually we, we sputtered back into existence for a while and then we really went bankrupt. So, um, it was, it had moved a lot of people. It was interesting. It was certainly an exciting group of people to work with because you had a lot of people who had East Coast ideas and you had a lot of people who had the Albuquerque school with the motivation. Probably one of the most interesting things ILS did in, in the Bay Area was run a school for kids. They set it up for their own kids and then they let it, ILS school became a a general school in San Rafael for a while. Jim Evans ran it for a while. Um, and they use motivational techniques. One of the things that fascinated one of the guys that worked for me's daughter was very shy. And the same motivation works in reverse. They had the kids who did math lessons, when they got that, when they did enough math, they got to go outside and play for a while as a group. This girl didn't want to go outside and play with the group. So they said, they told her, if you go out and play with the group, then you can come in and do math lessons. So the same model, the same model worked. And the, and the reverse with the kids. And she got, she did a lot of playing with the group and the other kids did a lot of math. So she did math too. In any case, uh, I worked with ILS until they went bankrupt. I'm now in the Bay Area. There are a lot of other people in the Bay Area who know about instructional technology all of a sudden. Uh, and it's about 1973, 74, 73. Um, I originally decided I was going to go uh, camp out on a beach in Mexico and get my life together. I mean, this is the 70s, right? So we're all into drugs and rock and roll. Um, Along the way of getting getting in, I picked up the idea that I like to do mountain climbing, and I'd gone to Yosemite and done some climbing while working at ILS. Uh, I read about a group in Palo Alto that was doing setting up a mountain climbing school. I went down. It turned out this group in Menlo Park was Behavioral Research Labs, BRL. This is another group that had done programmed instruction. I remember at, when I was in New York reading a Time Magazine article about a guy named Michael Sullivan, who was the guy that headed BRL, and how he would sit in Palo Alto in this beautiful view of the ocean and, and write program instruction. Well, I don't know where Michael had gone by the time I got there, but the other BRL people were surviving as educational people doing various things. And one of the things they've done is decided to set up an outward bound school because one of the people there was in outward bound and they'd hired the guy who'd been the head of outward bound at Colorado to come back or an assistant deputy director in Colorado to come and head their school. And he ended up getting a contract with the public schools of what was it? Um, 
San Luis Obispo, small town in California, well, not too small, um, to integrate outdoor education with public school. And he didn't know how to do that. And so I ended up talking with him for a while and saying, well, I could do that. You know, you build curriculum around learning objectives and you, you build instructional materials. And so we'll, you know, we'll sit down and we'll look at an environment and we'll break it up and we'll do something about the deer and something about the grass and something about the, the soil. Uh, so I ended up, it was, it was a government demonstration project. I ended up doing some of that for a while um, and got more interested in Outward Bound. He ended up leaving BRL and going back to become director of the Colorado School, which is a big Outward Bound school in Colorado. Uh, and I pursued that for a while. I, he would hire me to come there. In fact, he didn't have much money, and so he didn't pay me anything to speak of. He'd give me free Outward Bound trips. And so I would do river rafting trips and I would do mountain climbing trips with the Outward Bound School, uh, mostly helping them develop objectives for their classes. Um, I, it got me from, from, from strictly behavioral objectives into things called affective objectives, uh, things about how you, uh, how you get people's, how you change people's attitudes and affects. Um, that led, just as an aside, to Outward Bound and wanting to encourage that, and they set up a group called the Society for Experiential Education. Uh, I ended up keynoting the first conference on experiential education in North Carolina in probably 1970, say five, um, because Outward Bound was sponsoring the conference and I reported on the affective objectives work we were doing at Outward Bound. Um, one of the people I met there was somebody from Earlham College, my, my old college, who, who was interested in setting up an experiential program at, at Earlham. And they ended up, they now have one where the kids go out and do mountain climbing and stuff like that during some who knows what, their junior year. Um, so that was one sort of weird spinoff. Uh, I knew people from New York and I ended up writing textbooks for Wiley. So Wiley had a program instruction series left over from the great days of program instruction. Uh, I wrote one book on accounting. I wrote a book on ecology since I already had been studying that. Um, and I wrote a book on music theory since I was attending music theory operas and symphonies in the Bay Area and was interested in, in music. Um, it taught me a lot about programmed instruction. The accounting book, and beginning accounting isn't really accounting, it's bookkeeping. The, the beginning accounting book was straightforward programmed instruction. I mean, you have to learn certain things. You have to set up a set of accounts. You have to enter data in certain places. You have to learn what types of things get entered as what types of data. Uh, it can all be set up as exercises. It can be all done as frames very easily. Um, by that time, I was writing frames that were probably a paragraph to two paragraphs long uh, with a lot of models and diagrams to make them more interesting, but they were still frames. They would read half a page and then they would answer a question and they would read another half a page and answer another question. Um, so. The accounting text was easy. The ecology text was a bit harder. Ecology is more complex. You aren't really teaching a kid, and in bookkeeping, you're teaching a kid to keep books. And in ecology, you're not teaching a kid to be an ecologist exactly. You're teaching, it's a, it's a college general purpose course. It's education, whatever education means. It means general knowledge, that you keep that you might use someday, you know, but it's not training. It's not, it's not a skill that you practice. It's a body of knowledge that you maintain for a while. <laughs> uh, if, if it becomes your profession, you continue to remember it. If it doesn't become your profession, you remember it for a while and then you forget most of it. In any case, ecology turns out to be, at least my version of it, turns out to be a lot of models and a lot of diagrams, things that people can hold on to 
and think of ways of thinking about the world. And so there's there's the ecology of of food webs, and there's the bit of ecology on uh, nitrogen cycles there, and uh, trophic energy trophic levels. So you you organize ecology into basic thing, concept areas, and then you teach those concepts. Um, I, I liked the book. It sold well. So apparently other people liked it as well um, for a while. I mean, ecology was very hot in 75, and it sold for two or three years very well. The accounting book sold almost forever, but it's just a few copies each year. Um, the music theory book took a lot longer to work on. I decided program instruction simply didn't work for music. It, it could have, but somewhere along the line, Don Toasty wrote a paper. And basically what, what the paper he wrote was on media and the use of media in program instruction. And what Don basically said was, strictly behaviorist, if you want to teach someone something, you look at what the nature of the stimulus is, and then you provide a medium that will allow you to respond to that stimulus correctly. Well, if you think about that, what is music? Well, <laughs> music is one of two things. It's hearing music and responding somehow, or it's making music. And the, the, response, the response is to, say, a set of notes, use some sort of instrument to generate them. I played around with writing that out on paper for a while. I came up with all kinds of clever diagrams. Uh, drove my uh, co-author crazy because he was, of course, a music theorist and knew how you diagram music. You had five lines and you put dots on it. And the idea of other ways of trying to do that just made him nervous. But the fact is that that's overwhelming. I mean, what they want to teach in the first year of music theory or basic music, I mean, there are two versions of it. One version of it, you listen to a lot of things and respond. And the other version is you learn to read music and understand a little bit about what's going on. Uh, either version is massive um, amount of information and trying to respond to it. So when our book came out, I was at a, at a who knows what conference, but I'm somewhere where booksellers were showing their wares. And I walked the woman who was my editor around the conference to another thing and I pointed to a computer which we're talking we're talking at the beginning of the 80s at this point and for IBM computer on the IBM PC was introduced in 1981 so that's about the date we're talking about and the Mac had been introduced a little bit before this and I pointed out a Mac program that was teaching music theory and I said that's what you have to use to teach music theory. Paper won't do it. You know, they can read this all they want and they won't hear any sound. And they can look at a music score, but it doesn't mean anything because they're not making those intervals on an instrument where they can feel and see what's going on. The computer put a keyboard on the thing. They could actually take their finger and punch in the keys and see what happened, not the well, what the intervals were. They could hear the music on the computer. And I said, that's what you're gonna, that's where you have to go with music. This book is not going to work very well. Um, and it didn't, uh, it didn't sell well at all. <laughs> and uh, some of that may be the book and, and my not getting it quite right, but more I think the people in the music area, at the minute they started seeing computer programs, realized that textbooks weren't the way to teach introduction to music theory. So three different versions, three different steps away from strictly what was originally programmed instruction. Uh, in the course of, uh, by this time I'm in my, whatever my next, I'm, I'm Harmon Associates. Harmon Associates is the company I just created it went since I was going to live in the Bay Area and not go to Mexico. And I was going to work with Outward Bound and I was going to write program instruction books. Several of the people that had been at ILS moved to banks. At the time, banks had to be local by the state. So, and California is a big state. So we had a lot of big banks in California and a lot of them hired me. 
uh, a little bit later on, the, the action moved to computing with Silicon Valley. By 80, in the 80s, it moved to computing. And I started working more with computer companies. But in any case, I, I hardly did any program instruction. It was, it was instruction in a more general sense, mostly training classes where people would be expected to learn uh, how to do something. I mean, there was performance. Um, I don't know when ISPI changed its name. Um, probably, well, there were, there were a couple of name changes. They went from the National Society for Program Instruction to the National Society for Performance and Improve and Instruction, Performance and Instruction. And then they went to the uh, International Society for Performance and Instruction. And then they finally arrived at uh, the National Society for Performance Improvement. But uh, there's a famous quip by Joe Harless. He didn't like this concept of performance and instruction. He said that's like naming something the Department of Transportation and Bicycles. Um, but so there was a big controversy as to, you know, moving away from program instruction and any instruction into another set of variables. But that was a controversy when I first joined in 1979 and 80. Um, I, think, I think some of that reflects what I was speaking of earlier about instruction versus motivation. For some people, performance has motivation in it. And for some people, instruction doesn't have motivation in it. I mean, again, Joe Harless learned his basics from Tom Gilbert <laughs> uh, before Praxis was even set up. Uh, so he, he came very much from the tradition of designing instruction. Um, in any case, where am I? I'm, in, I'm at the beginning of the 80s. I'm running a company called Harmon Associates. Uh, we're doing a lot of work for banks and we're doing a lot of work for a computer company. Uh, I'm mostly, I, I end up doing a lot of work for IT departments and to banks where they want the people, the business people to tell them what they're doing. And in hindsight today, I would look back, I'd say they want to, they want the process. They want a process flow diagram. And, Somebody is saying, will you automate the accounting department? And they're saying, well, okay, tell me what accounting does. And the accountants give them a funny explanation and they don't find that useful. Um, so the banks would end up hiring me and I would do flow diagrams and lay out just what the steps were. And those kinds of flow diagrams are a little bit arbitrary. You pick the level of analysis you want, whether you want to have, you know, um, open account, um, uh, take, rece take receipts, close account, or whether you want to get into, you know, the, the steps involved in opening an account. Um, but that was an easy thing for somebody in program instruction to do. And I usually had a contract or two where two or three of the people working with me would just be interviewing experts and laying out diagrams for what they did. Um, so anyway, let's say we're at, at 1982-3. Uh, somewhere along the line, I've acquired an IBM PC and learned how to do that. Jim Evans got a contract from I don't know who to write program, or not program, instruction for using computers. And he subcontracted me and I used the money to buy a computer and write two or three classes, courses for him. Um, I moved on to Macs pretty quickly and I had a, I was involved in the, the probably ISPI at this point, but uh, the ISPI chapter in Silicon Valley. And so I would go down there and meet people. It was a good way to network. Uh, I met a lot of the computer people, including the Apple people. And one of the guys, when Lisa first came on the market said, you know, hey, Lisa is a very hot program and I can buy it at a discount, but I don't, I haven't got the money and I don't want one. Do you want to buy it? And I said, sure, I'll buy yours. So I ended up for lease on my desk and it was, it changed the world of computing for me. I mean, I, I finally taught my secretary how to use an IBM, but it was just hell. I mean, it was, 
it was like, you know, no, it was, we're talking blue screen here, right? You know, all this. See, that cursor only has one little arrow in front of it. That's a level two, and that's the operating system. But when it gets two, level, two little arrows, that means you're in Word. And now you're in, if you want to do, you can't use this command because that's an operating system command. You can only use these commands because these are Word commands. And so I mean, the original IBM was so hierarchical, and you had to constantly keep it in mind to know where you were. Uh, Lisa was graphic and just did away with all that. Um, I started using it extensively and then moved on to Mac. Um, I've gone back to IBM several times. So I end up now, I have two machines here. And I did that because for many years, I worked at companies that all used only IBM equipment and would send you things in Word for IBM. And if you, did, if you couldn't read them, you were it was just too much trouble not to be able to do it. Um, I got a job in 1982, I guess, from a company called Technology. They were a startup from Stanford University that was going to develop expert systems. Expert systems, I learned, was a type of AI, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence was that branch of computing that tried to figure out how to make computers do smarter things. And you can get into all kinds of philosophy about whether it's human reasoning or act like humans, but really, you know, the first AI programs were, were Excel programs. Excel was a kind of AI. Uh, and then they moved on from that to other things that were equally clever, use, the use of mouse, a mouse for a computer was a kind of AI for a while. Um, the languages that that Mac was written in, Mac was written in a, a language, in a, what's a class of languages called object-oriented programming. It, it substituted line commands for a more graphic approach that thought of the world as objects that communicated with each other. Um, so all of this came out of AI. So AI was just this cauldron of, of computer scientists who were trying to figure out smarter things to do with computers. And one of the things they did was build an expert, two or three expert systems. And what they meant by that was they interviewed a human expert. They captured the knowledge the human expert had and then used it to solve the kinds of problems the human expert solved. The way they captured the knowledge was as rule. If X, then Y. And that sounds easy, but it isn't because one of the programs was Mycin. Mycin was a program to analyze meningitis infections. They worked with the two or three people at Stanford Medical Center that were the best in the world on meningitis infections. Um, they would they asked this person if somebody if somebody came into your office and sat down and coughed that <laughs> they think they had meningitis, what would you do? And they'd say, well, I'd do this. And so they'd write a rule. If patient comes in, then ask name. I mean, it goes on like this. So Mycin ended up being a system that worked reasonably well, and it had 10,000 rules. Those 10,000 rules were not in a web. They were 10,000 independent rules that interfaced only because the variables in the rules could trigger other rules. If A, then B. And if you're given that, you look around and say, how would I know A? Here's a rule that says, if X, then A. So you ask X. And then here's a rule that says, if Y, then X. So you ask Y. So you could progress through these rules logically, using logical techniques to figure out what basic questions, what fundamental questions you had to ask. And then you could reason from that to various things. Um, it turns out that there are many kinds of meningitis. Some patients um, have cases that where you can't be sure which one it is. Some of them are mild cases, but some are infectious, will kill you very quickly. So what, you, what a good doctor does is he figures out which type of meningitis you could have. And that usually means you could have four or five. 
and then he uses drugs to treat for the, any of them that could be deadly. <laughs> and then he waits because he can, he can take a sample and, and culture it and figure out what you have, but it's going to take him two weeks. So he wants to treat you the same day that you came into his office. So he, he uses something like asking these questions, decides on what you might have and what probabilities that you might have it. Then he treats all the high probability cases that might be dangerous, okay? Um, when, when the AI people introduced that to most computer programming people, they didn't get it, right? They, they, I mean, computing wasn't that old. We're talking 1980. Computing really got into business in the 60s. So it's had 20 years. Uh, but most of that time, there weren't computer science departments. I mean, Ed Feigenbaum, who's the leading expert for AI and, and for, for expert systems, was trained under Newell and Simon at uh, Mass MIT. And I'm sorry, Carnegie Mellon, which is interesting because that's where Lloyd Homme and Jim Evans were trained. Carnegie Mellon, and it was doubly interesting because at the time, Homme and Evans would have been learning program instruction, which is to say behavioral psychology. Newell and Simon were revolutionizing psychology by introducing cognitive psychology and cognitive techniques. In any case, um, the... I just lost it. You're going to have to cut this part out when you when you <laughs> add it a bit. Um, You're saying computing was was just recently, you know, 20 years old. Okay, computing 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 is is recent. It's been around for 20 years. When most companies started computing, they wanted to build systems like bookkeeping and accounting, maybe personnel that would keep track of data on people. Uh, data on customers. These are pretty basic systems and they use basic languages like basic, uh, COBOL uh, and Fortran. And these guys hadn't been trained as computer scientists. Ed Feigenbaum was trained in the business school. Uh, Noel, Noel Simon, Simon won his Nobel Prize for his work on expert systems or for his work on AI. And he won it in the business for business and economics. Uh, economics. So, I mean, there just wasn't computing. And then slowly computing science developed. So by the 80s, there were departments of computer science. But in the meantime, all the people that had been hired at companies, had they just hired bright people who could solve problems. And so they had people whose background was business or who was biology or whatever. Uh, they'd, they'd learned COBOL and they'd learned how to program computers. So they had a very rigid step-by-step idea of how computers work. It was like us with PI. We thought the only way to teach, for a while, we thought the only way to teach people was with step-by-step -step program instruction. And somebody said, no, no, it's much more complex than that. Well, it's much more complex than that in computers too. And the expert systems introduced systems that used probabilities that reached answers that might have been wrong. In some cases, they missed, just like humans, they misdiagnosed what the person's case of meningitis was. You know, it, it, was, it was an 80% chance, but it wasn't in fact that meningitis. So the, the expert system just represented a different way of computing people thinking about things. When business decided to adopt expert systems, explore, expert systems is probably the right word. Um, they had to relearn what computing was all about. They had to pick up the 10 years of computer science that they hadn't learned when they when they started working in COBOL and building business uh, bookkeeping systems. Um, so technology set out to build expert systems for people, but they first had to teach computer science to a lot of these guys. And they had trouble teaching it. They had a lot of AI people from Stanford University come over and deliver lectures that no normal human being could ever possibly understand. Uh, so I would sit at the back of the class and take notes. Then I got to go up and ask the expert afterwards what he'd said. What did you really say this? What do you mean by this? I'd make suggestions about how he should do it next time. 
we even got to the point where we'd ask them to submit their slides so we could check them beforehand. They did. And then they changed their minds at the last moment and put in a lot of new slides that we hadn't seen. Uh, but I did this for six months. It was, it was my education in computing, and it was wonderful. I had some of the best people in the world in computing sitting around answering my dumb questions because they wanted to build a decent course to teach people. Uh, and we did the same thing when their, when their software tool came out. I sat down and helped them figure out how to do that. Uh, build a core, build a step by step. I'd done several courses in computers by that, so I, I had some idea how you do it. You build a matrix, and on one side of the matrix, you put the behaviors that the person's going to have when they're done, and on the other side, you put the topics, and then you end up saying, well, "What is the minimum topic I can give to introduce this behavior?" And then, "What's the next one?" And then, "How do I build up?" Now I've got the person doing that behavior. What behave? What information do I introduce for them doing the next behavior I want them to do? And so you can flow out a plan for how somebody should approach it without overwhelming them. Um, I ended up, when technology was sort of done with the basic class, I ended up writing a book on that. The book was, was Expert Systems AI for Business. Um, that I co-authored it with the guy who was working with me at the time. That book sold very well. I mean, it was translated in about seven languages. Um, it was book of the month club sort of thing for science book club. Um, that sort of overnight established me as an expert in business, expert systems, which is wrong, of course. I wasn't an expert. There were real experts in, and they were at, at technology. But on the other hand, they didn't relate to business people very well. And I did. And so the book I wrote was the first book that talked about expert systems in ways that business people could understand it. It, it focused on what you would use them for and what the basic and for what the basic ideas you had to master to understand them. One of the things I'm very proud of is that I included a detailed example in my first book on expert systems. And I used Don Tosti's media model. And so I basically showed what rules you would write and how you would put them in the system to build a small expert system that would help people choose the media to use with a particular type of problem. I mean, this is pretty simple. This is, I mean, the expert system people always use, how do you choose a wine to go with your meal? And I use how do you choose the right media to use with a particular set of stimuli. But the point is, I realized in doing that, that the expert systems that they were talking about were 10,000 rules. They cost a small fortune to develop. You had to take world-class experts. I mean, they built systems to predict where oil wells should be drilled. Um, the military wanted a system very badly. They, they sent satellites over Russia every day and scanned all of Russia. But that, entered, that created so much data that they could not possibly begin to look at it. And so what, in fact, they did was look at the sites that they already knew about to see if there was any new work going on. But they didn't look at any other to see where new sites were being built. That would have been massive. They wanted a system that could do that. They wanted something that would work like their, and they got it, to work like their human expert, to look at the data and scan for a new sites that were being developed. Okay, so I mean, these were, but these are big tasks and they're very complex and they take a year and a year and a half to develop and you spend, you have two or three expert system developers working with one or two human experts writing hundreds of thousands of rules in some cases. Okay. Um, that little system I wrote, was whatever it was, say 25 rules, say 50 rules. And it could, it could almost instantly show you what media were available to use if you were trying to teach someone music and, and what, you, what the stimulus was, was sound and uh, uh, music notation on a page. Okay. Uh, and so I sort of realized that, you know, two things. One is I could do it. You know, I might not be able to sit down with the meningitis expert and do that, 
but I could I could sit down with Don Toasty, get this, have him explain his model to me, get some rules, do some research about what media were available at the time, and write it out. So that was one. The other one was it would it was useful. It was a small system, but it was useful because it was quick and easy to do. Uh, and it became I became obsessed with at the, in what we would have been at the time in ISPI called job aid. Expert Systems was a, was a media in which to develop simple job aids. Uh, I gave a couple of papers on this at ISPI. That's my, my sharing bit. I went back. I hadn't been to ISPI for three or four years because I'd been in, mostly in computer stuff. But I went back and said, this is a real thing. You got to get onto it. And a few people did. There was actually some work with other people at ISPI on, on that small expert system. Um, and more to the point, the whole expert system movement got a lot of people out of the computer labs and into the commercial world. And a lot of the tools from, from game playing on, a lot of the tools that are out that we use now have elements of AI in them, okay? And they're, they're easy to use. A lot of us do use tools today, uh, learning tools, education tools, um, uh, lesson planning tools. That, that have elements of AI in them. And it's the basic idea, let the computer do a certain amount of the work, give it a bunch of rules so it can make some decisions behind the screen uh, and help people put together small systems that are very useful to them. Um, when, the, when the world of AI was set up, they, the idea here was that a few large companies would dominate the world and they would build these huge systems. In fact, a huge number of companies, a hundred companies, joined the market very quickly. And many of them had small systems that ran on PCs that helped people do little things. And the people at Technology just dismissed this out of hand, right? I mean, they were, they were university professors who had worked for 20 years to master their craft. And the idea that these two guys from NASA sat down and built a little system that helped NASA keep track of what to pack for the space program uh, didn't mean a thing to them. You know, why would anybody bother to do that? Um, another one, one of the guys at Technology, somebody said, you know, we we're going to, uh, we need to have systems that run on mainframes. And they said, you know, why would anybody want to run an expert systems on a mainframe? It's a big system. You need a big, powerful, single focused computer. Well, 95% of the world of business used mainframes at that time. All the data was on mainframes. Any large company that was going to use an expert system had to build a system that could use the data in their databases and feed it to people out there who were sitting in front of PCs. So, you know, there was just a disconnect between the, the, the theory and the large size. In any case, um, I wrote the book on expert systems. The book got me a certain amount of attention. Um, I had a woman, uh, Karen Coburn, who published newsletters, who came to me at a conference and said, I'm looking for somebody to edit a newsletter on expert systems. So we talked about it. I ended up doing that. So for the next 10 years, my primary business was every day, uh, 16 pages a month, every month, <laughs> on what was going on in the expert systems market. Um, at that time, we didn't have computing the way we did now, and newspapers were actually an important way of getting information. I mean, at one point, IBM was buying 150 copies of the newsletter a month to spread out to all the people at IBM so they could keep track of how the market was developing. Um, it was fascinating to me. I'd, I'd watched the performance of the, the program instruction market indirectly in late and, and late in the game when I was at basic systems and so forth uh, and talk and sit down and talk to somebody like Marty Manchin. He'd talk about the great days of BI when they were making money every direction you turned and everybody wanted to learn about the uh, program instruction and how, how they sold it to Xerox and all made a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was a great experience. Expert systems was the same thing. It was a bunch of, academic people coming out into the market, introducing exciting ideas, lots and lots of other people joining them to build companies that would 
do this sort of thing. Um, I probably was most popular, the newsletter was most popular, among companies that didn't commit to building big expert systems, but were more interested in smaller expert systems, because that came much more natural to me. From my point of view, they were just a part of talking performance and structure. They're performance and instruction, right? You're trying to get somebody to do something. That's what it came down to. And you were going to use a computer, and you were going to build a software program on the computer that the human would use that would structure the task for the human and then ultimately give them directions about what to do. It was a job aid. It was a very big, elaborate, costly job aid in some cases, but it was a job aid and I felt like I understood it. Um, just like any other area of computing. I mean, half the time in computing, my the work I'd done as Har in Harmon Associates was getting people to use or getting people to understand what the computer program needed them to do. It, I mean, the, they would build, they would spend a huge amount of money, a company, insurance company. I'm not naming any names here. <laughs> insurance company spent a lot of money. They built a, a software program that was going to run on mainframes and appear on screens. And suddenly they just said, okay, you know, a month from now, we're going to roll it out. And somebody said to them, how are the people going to know about this? You know, what are, what are we, what are we going to tell the people who are doing it right now? Oh, well, we, we need some training. We need some training to do that. You know, get them all in a room and tell them we're introducing a new computer system. So I made my money working as fast as I could to get from get to help the computer people prepare the audience to actually use the computer. Um, and often helping the computer people straighten things out because they, they didn't get it right. Their analysis was never that good, really. Um, and we, we, would, we had a whole technique that we'd run through several times, made a lot of money with it, where basically we'd sit down with someone who was doing a task right now, often using a computer, and we'd ask for all the forms they used, paper, paper forms that they used, and we'd line them all up. And then we'd go right down the form, item by item, and say, what do you do with this information? What do you do with this? And often, they just move it from one form to another. They transfer it. They say, OK. We just check them off. And we'd end up with a list of all the information that came in and what they did with it. Then we'd go back and we'd look at the computer program screens. They'd, we'd get the computer group to print out their screens. We'd look at the screens, and we'd find the information. And we'd end up with a list of 40 items that weren't on any screen. And so we'd say to the guys, what happened to these 40 items? You know, maybe they're no longer needed. Maybe you've got some algorithm that will do this calculation so you don't need to, et cetera. But tell us, just go through the checklist. Tell us why you've eliminated, why you're confident you can eliminate each one of these items. Because they're still going to be coming in. The way the system is set up right now, these forms will arrive at the clerk's desk. And they've got this information and they're either going to enter it in your program or they're just going to look at it and not know what to do with it and throw it away or file it, you know, forever. And so, you know, we usually, we could usually help computing people clean up their programs and we could almost always help the, the humans get ready for the computer. Um, that was just as true of the expert system. A lot of the stuff we did in the expert system today did that. Um, expert systems went from about 1983 when I started the newsletter to about 1993, 10 years. I watched the industry rise and fall. Uh, it did fall. <laughs> the, the essence of it is the, the experts, some of the expert systems are still used today and are very valuable. Most of them prove too expensive. And it wasn't the cost of development, although that cost was high. It was the cost of maintenance. Human experts are constantly learning. They go to conferences, they read books. The world changes and they study new materials and they modify the way they work. These expert systems would capture what an expert knew and did at a point in time. And then the world would move on. And unless that expert system was constantly changed, it 
wouldn't be up to date. And it was 10,000 rules it, that had to work together because all of the names were synchronized so that the logic, <laughs> if A, then B, and here's a rule that says if X, then A, those have to work together and they, they wouldn't. When you start adding rules, you screw those systems up real fast. So the cost was huge. And it turned out that it was just too much. Uh, and expert systems companies expanded to a certain point and then all of a sudden, and they consolidated, they did all the things you're supposed to do as you grow up a, a, an industry. They consolidated and so forth, but then suddenly they just petered out. There were, they still had work coming in, but it wasn't enough to maintain the staff they created. Uh, a good idea that didn't quite fit the needs of business. Uh, that was, from my point of view, that was in 1993-4. I was still writing the newsletter, experts, and we changed the name of the newsletter, of course, from expert system strategies to intelligent system strategies, just like in the eye, you gotta keep broadening your, your scope. Um, I worked for a while, maybe another 10 years, in software and object-oriented programming. Object-oriented technology is comes out of, well, the AI people used it to capture large bodies of knowledge and build neural networks. So, well, networks, let's start there. So you'd, in, you'd have a an object called animal, and then that animal would have bird, mammal, fish as its descendants. And then fish would have characteristics like scale. And so so you, you built these networks of knowledge. This is, this is strictly cognitive science. You built these networks of knowledge so that when I had a rule that says, does the, if the animal has scales, then the animal's a fish. And I can get rid of a lot of rules like that by just saying, you know, if the animal has any of these characteristics and it's a fish and I could play, if, if it's a fish, I know it's an animal. And if it's an animal, I know it's a whatever, living thing. So it, the, I got used to the networks and I was able to write a newsletter on object technology for 10 years, another 10 years. So I'm, all that time, I'm mostly giving lectures and writing books on computing technology, if you would. Around 19... Uh, I'm sorry, around 2000, 2001, 2002, I decided I didn't want to continue doing object technology. It was growing by leaps and bounds. It was becoming part of computing in general. Um, I didn't feel my background in, in computing science was strong enough. And I didn't want to be on a treadmill to keep up with all the new developments. So I thought, let's go back to something simple. Let's go back to not program instruction, but something like it. Um, I decided I'd work, play around with business process. Gary, Gary Rumler had taught me program instruction. Gary Rumler had moved to Praxis. He and Tom had split. I don't know exactly what the date was, but sometime in the 70s, probably 73 or something. Gary had gone on to another company uh, for a while, and then he uh, did some sort of management decision making. And then he'd set up his own company, and he'd focused on um, process, analyzing business processes. Um, he'd taken that company to a certain point and then sold it sometime in the mid or late 90s. And I'd followed all this indirectly, keeping track of talking to Gary at meetings and stuff. So I decided, you know, I'd like to get back and I'd like to look, play with the process stuff because as far as I was concerned, all the different things that I'd been playing with were variations on process one way or the other. They're getting this, business is doing things. Uh, a process is how business accomplishes work. Uh, if you think of performance as what people do, then process is what businesses hope they'll do. Um, so I suggested to Gary writing a book, uh, a new book. And what I wanted to do was introduce a lot of the computer concepts that I knew about to make the process descriptions a lot better. 
Gary and I, that didn't work. Uh, Gary had put too much energy into thinking of the things the way he thought of them. And that he didn't really want to learn all about computing. And I thought that you needed it. I mean, one way of looking at it is when, when Gary looks at his three-tiered model of what goes on, you've got the executive level, and then you've got the management level, and then you have the human level. And I thought there was nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'd used it all my life. But I, at the human level, it seemed to me what you really had to do was split it because computers were there. And so management could give a task. They could give it to a person to do, or they could give it to a computer, or they could give it to a combination. There was really three options. And each of those options introduced different things. In other words, if you, if you, if you analyze as a task and you decided a person was going to do it, you had to train the person to do it. If you analyzed the task and you decided a computer could do it, you had to write software to get the computer to do it. And there was a whole series of steps that were involved in getting the computer to do it. If you analyzed the task and decided it was both, then you ended up having to do both. You had to <laughs> develop the computer system and develop a training system to teach the person how to use the computer. So it seemed to me that it was easy to think about how to take, start with Gary, what Gary was at and expand it to include some of this other stuff. Um, when I actually started working on the book myself, I ended up finding out that the world of process that Gary described wasn't nearly, didn't describe the, the actual world that was out there completely. And I ended up dividing the world of process into three traditions. Um, I wrote an article on this. It's the lead article in a handbook, the handbook of process and management or something like that. And it's the most downloaded article in the book. Turns out very expensive handbooks are not bought too much these days. Uh, students now learn that they can download particular chapters. And apparently a lot of instructors assign this chapter as a way of getting people to think about what's going on in process. The, one of the ways of thinking about the world is management ways of thinking. And that, I put Gary Rumler there. In other words, business people want to get the company to perform better. And again, for a long time, that's what Gary's company used to do. They used to bring business managers together and each manager would talk about what his problems were, what wasn't working. And then they would do diagrams. They would do flow plans to try to pin down exactly what it was that they were doing and then look to see where there were problems. Okay. So that's sort of a management approach. And there were a lot of people at business schools who had other theories that went right along with that. Um, a second school was um, human, a human performance school. Uh, which starts out at, I'm blocking on a name here, but it starts out at about 2000, or I'm sorry, 1910 with, with books on uh, human, uh, human uh, work, work efficiency. And Taylor? They, blocking on his name with the stop. Taylor? Taylor. Yeah, Taylor. Taylor, uh, Taylor uh, would, would time people, uh, the one best way of doing it. And he was very strongly associated with Henry Ford with the original production line. Instead of each craftsman doing whatever he did his own individual way, there was going to be a, a line of people and each one was going to be studied and do what he did the best way. So that there were conferences on that. This, that was very popular in the 20s. There were conferences on that. Those conferences ended up influencing people like Deming, who then went to Japan after World War II and helped the Japanese develop what we'd call Six Sigma today. Okay. Um, separately from Deming, there was a group of people at Toyota who developed the Toyota method, uh, on, which is called Lean these days. And now a lot of people would talk about Lean and Six Sigma. Uh, but they're all variations on how to work with, with people to develop and, and not just people it's machines as well but how to work how to focus on getting people to perform okay and then the third school is certainly the it people and 
they've come up with their own tradition and they're, they're business analysts who are, whose loyalty is entirely to IT, who do think a little bit about training, but would really primarily focus on, you know, developing a flow plan that shows what the computer should do. Okay, and, and working with the business people to specify goals for the computer applications. And those three didn't really talk to each other very much circa 1990. Uh, I wrote a book where I tried to, the first book I wrote, Business Process Change, I tried to talk about all those different schools as just variations on core ideas. And the core ideas were process and performance. You had to know what you needed to do and you had to know how to get your tool, humans or computers or machines. I mean, in the 20s and 30s and 40s, it was all machines that were replacing people, not computers, you know, and uh, the great big things that punched, punched holes or brought frames of cars together. Um, those, it happened in 1993 when I got started with the process work that the internet had just become very popular. And with the internet, there were, there are different protocols. Email is a protocol. Uh, XML was a protocol that connected things together. In, in the eighties, Gary's company had gotten a lot of attention and Gary in fact sold his company based on the fact that there was business process re-engineering. This was a movement that started in 1992 or something, three, by a couple of books written by people about how important computing was. Uh, Michael Hammer is one of the guys. And Hammer, one of his famous quotes is that we've used computers to pave cow paths. And now we have to strip all that out and build freeways. Okay, and he described a bunch of different applications that a lot of people launched off so to build. And it turns out they didn't have the technology to do it. So if you looked at computing, one of the things he described was how you connect up all the different applications and they talk to each other. Well, in 1993, there were no general ways of connecting up computers. There were proprietary languages. And each of those proprietary languages had its own characteristics. And if you wanted to connect an application you had that was doing one thing with an application doing something else to pass information, you had to code that by hand, okay? If you're a large company, if you're General Motors or something, that's not a problem. You've got several thousand computer programmers and, and two of them can specialize in that language and build, build, language, build connectors. But most companies didn't have that much expertise in the connection and it was just too hard. So lots of things that they said were great to do and that people set off to do, uh, often set off by firing way too many people <laughs> and thinking they could get way much, much more efficiency out of the system than they ever managed. So that had sort of petered out by the end of the 90s. In 2003, with the internet, you had a protocol called XML. The details aren't important, but XML is why all of us can send things by way of email. We, no matter what it is and what application we wrote it in, we just treat it as a file and we attach it. And XML manages the interface between the file and we pass it to somebody else who can either open it in, in the email or they can, if they have the original, it's a Word document, you open it in Word. Uh, if it isn't, there are programs that will open almost anything. Um, XML revolutionized the ability to connect things. A missing piece is that in the late 90s, it was very popular to build, to replace applications. We were all afraid Y2K was gonna destroy computing. The idea of Y2K is that too many people had coded O2 as the year, but they didn't, the system didn't know whether it was 1902 or 2002. And so a lot of big companies had to spend a lot of time going back and looking at key programs to be sure that their date systems had four digits instead of two. 
Um, and that took a lot of time and many companies couldn't afford to do it. So what they did was they ended up buying applications from companies like SAP. Uh, and they were off the shelf, quick and dirty applications that did one thing or another. I say quick and dirty, that's not quite fair, but uh, they, SAP had its suite of, of accounting applications and two or three other companies did as well. SAP was just the largest. Uh, but you replaced the accounting applications you had with the SAP applications and you were guaranteed that they all used four digit dates. And so you didn't have any problem with them. Problem was that SAP wouldn't talk to anybody else's application. They wouldn't talk with SAP. So companies that used one, one set of applications for accounting and another set of applications for sales and another set of applications for who knows what, management reporting, found out that they had a lot of applications that wouldn't talk to each other and they were stuck with the whole thing about connecting them up much harder. The business process world, once you had the internet, people realized they could build flow diagrams that showed what they wanted to have happen. We want the, we want the accounting program, we want the, the customer data program to pass this information to the accounting program. And what the accounting program to pass this information to the management uh, planning program. Okay, you could build a flow plan that would show what you wanted to have happen. And then you could automatically generate that code with XML. In other words, you could build an engine, a software engine that would generate the code that would do what you described in the diagram. Now it's not that simple and it hasn't worked as well as it could have, but it worked well enough. And so all of a sudden, there was a lot of interest in process, a different kind of interest than there had been in the 90s. And it was all focused on coordinating and organizing all the different computer programs. Um, I, my book came out just about the same time as this got off, got started. And the newsletter got started. And for, for the people, a lot of people subscribed to the newsletter because they wanted to know about process. And I had to scramble to learn a lot about XML. And the, the whole business process management was the term they used to describe these kinds of software systems that would connect everything automatically. So I started using the term business process management, but I wanted to use it more broadly because I knew that what, if they weren't careful, they were just going to do what the computer people had done before. They were going to build the application drop it on the people and the people would have no idea what they were dealing with. So I ended up trying to say, look, process is more complex. It's not just the computers, it's also the people. And it's not just the computers and the people, it's also the management. Gary used to say 20% of it was, was management. In other words, you could tell somebody to do something, but if you set the incentives up, motivation again, if you set the incentives up, so that every time the person did it, they got punished. They weren't going to do it, even though you were. We had an actual case that we used to use at Praxis Airline, uh, where the airline wanted to sell trips uh, in addition to airplane flights. And the, the clerk was supposed to ask when anybody who bought a trip ticket, would you like a would you like to have, you know, like to buy rent a car? Would you like to stay at this hotel? Yeah, additional questions. But management was at the, the supervisors at the center were totally focused on time. They kept track of how long each person took. And if anybody took very much longer than average, they were being yelled at. Okay, so the person that tries to sell things gets yelled at. They don't they soon learn it's not worth trying to sell things and they stop. You know, I mean this is a real case. So that didn't work. Management can write all the rules they want about how important it is to sell additional services. But as long as the supervisor rates people and, and gives bonuses and all that on based on how few minutes they take, it wasn't going to happen. So management is just as important in process work as people knowing how to do their job and software systems who were supposed to do what they do. And then finally, senior management, I'd still keep the three levels. I always did, even in the process. 
senior management has the problem of, of architecting it all together. You've got all these different applications that could talk to each other and who is responsible for seeing that they do? And who is responsible for seeing that the processes work together? This is a lot of lean work. A lot of the lean people were very into the fact that customer asks for something and it sets off processes that are supposed to fulfill it. And some of those processes do what they're supposed to do and others don't. And the fulfilling doesn't happen the way it's supposed to. It's a, it's a breakdown in the flow. And if you're talking about a small process, that doesn't usually happen because you can see the whole process. You start talking about a company where people are buying things online and in stores and from salesmen, and these orders are flowing through all kinds of different systems, things get lost very easily. And somebody has to do architectural level work. They have to think about these processes as fitting together into bigger processes and ultimately into value chains that cross the entire company. So that's sort of my last job. <laughs> I've had three careers at least, you know. Uh, certainly the first career was performance improvement or program instruction, whichever you prefer. Uh, certainly the second career was, was computing expert systems, uh, helping people figure out how to develop performance using expert systems. And the third career was process, trying to get people to do process work. So are you, st are you, so you have been for almost 20 years now, maybe not quite, uh, business process trends and that website and newsletters and the uh, accumulation of the, the thousands of articles by now, I would imagine. So what's the state of business process management? Is it waning? Is it, you know, is it, or is it still a, a, a powerful thing that, that is continuing on? Um, business process is perennial. If you looked at the 80s, you saw Six Sigma, and then there was a law, and then you saw business process re-engineering at the beginning of the 90s, and then there was a law, and then you saw the use of uh, packaged software applications like SAP, and then there was a law, <laughs> and then everybody got excited about the idea of using internet XML protocols to connect processes and things. And now there is another law. So there'll be something else. I suspect AI. A, the, the same AI that generated expert systems has now generated a much more robust version uh, of AI. Uh, they're called neural networks, or it's, sometimes they call it machine learning. They have the same problem we do with them. Uh, they're all over the place. But the point is that they've built systems that learn for themselves. I mean, if you're into learning theory, this is fascinating. Uh, the systems basically have, they, they, they need reinforcement. Let's, they have, they have, let's look at the system and learn how to play Go. They have the system learn the basic moves of how to play Go, and then they have it play an expert. And if it loses, and they say, well, that's a loss. But if it wins, then they, it increases the statistical confidence it has in each one of the moves that led to the win. You get it to play hundreds or thousands of games. And what you actually do is you get the system and then you make a copy of it and you have them play each other. We have these two systems. They can play a game of Go that would take humans uh, two or three days. They can play it in seconds. So you've got a computers that are playing millions of games against each other uh, in the course of a week. Okay, every time they win, they increment. Every time they lose, they at least stay the same or they decrement. Uh, after a while, they get better. So they're learning. Um, they, in the case of the, the, the Go system, the first round it played against the European Grandmaster in medium Three, three games out of five or something like that. Six months later, it played against the international grandmaster and it beat him three and a half games out of five. Uh, but he was just blown away. He he'd watched the earlier games and said he had confidence he could beat the computer with no trouble. 
uh, just like he could have beaten the European grandmaster, apparently, with no trouble. Uh, and the, the system beat him. It played a later, it played another, it played the leading Chinese grandmaster. And one of the things it did was introduce moves that they had never seen before, which have now been adopted by grandmasters who play the game. In other words, the computer not only got better itself, it learned, it not only learned, it innovated. Okay, and we're gonna see a lot more of that. In other words, the expert system, or not expert system, sorry, the AI systems, the neural network systems being developed today, um, are going, they're being applied to things like, well, medicine, okay. One of, the, one of the companies has negotiated for the, it's Google, as a matter of fact, has an AI division. They've negotiated for the for access to the, the British the NIH database. They have all the records on all the British patients on the, um, they're all on, their, on the database at, from England. Uh, they're going to study those just like they do the Go game. You know, what drugs were used with what patients in what amounts at what time. Um, and they're going to come up with generalizations, and some of those generalizations are going to be what a good doctor would think of. And a few of them are going to be weirdly different than anyone would have thought of. Uh, and they're going to advance the field of medicine. Uh, we're still going to want humans to look over their shoulder. <laughs> it's not like we go away, but they're going to they're going to improve how human performance, how process work is done. So process comes back. Process is, I mean, what can a company work, what can a company think about if it wants to survive? It can think about accounting. And if times get tough, that's what they do. They get an accountant in there who cuts out everything that doesn't need to be done. When times are good, it tries to grow. And you look for innovators who can come up with new ideas. You know, um, AI systems that support the innovators. Uh, so sooner or later, we've had, a, we've had a, a few bad years here, certainly the pandemic and so forth haven't helped. Uh, but you're going you're gonna to get growth years again, if not next year, the year after. And when you do, you're going to start seeing people in the process world trying to figure out how to combine AI with process tools, uh, develop more powerful, useful tools. Um, and it'll all take off again. Uh, the, the world of process is, I mean, this is true of all these fields from, from program instruction on. And then and, and, I mean, how do we get together and learn about these things? We go to conferences. Who pays for conferences? Vendors. So in the world of AI and expert systems, it's, it's all the computer companies, the vendors. If they're excited and they think there's software to sell, you get an exciting convention and a lot of money being spent and businesses sending people to learn out what the new hot thing is. And that goes on for a while. And then once they, they think they pretty well understand it, things start to die down for a while, uh, particularly if the tools don't sell well. Okay, and then a little while later, somebody comes up with a new idea, they'll make new tools. The companies get excited again. They start spending money to promote it. People come to conferences and we have another five or six good years. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in process at the moment, but it's none of it is, is that innovative or exciting. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an idea. There's a type of technique called data, uh, data mining, which is an AI technique. Uh, and they use it, they've now got it so that they look at the, they can look at a database and they can see if you have a process, uh, give a high level description of a process, they'll go back and see where, where each of the sub processes makes an entry into the database or where it gets data out. And so they can very quickly identify any kind of bottlenecks where you're putting a lot of data in, but you're getting it out very slowly, or you're getting it out very fast, but putting it in very slowly. So they can identify patterns and that's great. And a lot of people are excited about that right now and writing articles about you know, process mining. The point is, however, that if you don't have data, you can't do process mining. So if we're, at a, if we're at a company and they've been doing a process for 10 years and the process is, has a lot of automation, 
there's going to be a lot of data about what happens in the process. And the process, those mining tools are going to work very well. Okay. And, but that's not a lot of, that's only a part of process. <laughs> you know, there's new process. When the companies are moving in new directions, they're building processes that are new that don't have a lot of data. And those mining tools won't help. So I have nothing against the mining tools. I, I like them. But they're, they're, they're just a small piece of the puzzle. So we're, we're sitting waiting for another big innovation to come along, uh, which AI can probably deliver, but um, whatever. And what am I doing? I write a column every month and keep stir the pot, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. we, most of BP, most of my, business, my business income, there's some courses given in how to do process work, and they were mostly given by, by distributors. Mm -hmm. uh, most of those guys didn't do any business last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it'll be a while for recovery. Well, let me, let me shift gear a little bit now to uh, uh, later on in the questions that, uh, that I shared with you. But, you know, you're a lifelong learner. And so what, what are you currently focused on learning? Is there anything in particular that you can share with us? Or are you writing about anything that's new? Uh, I'm a lifelong earner who's running down. <laughs> Sorry to say it. I mean, I'm, I'm in my 70s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the last big article I finished, which finished this last week, was a retrospect review of expert systems. There was a conference of uh, a year or two ago, where they, uh, the Computer Museum in, in San Jose got a lot of people who'd been involved in expert systems together. We all reminisced. It was fun. Good cocktails. Uh, now we're writing a book where each of us is writing a chapter on something. And I spent a year, there was nothing, a lot, it went real slow last year. I spent a year with my reminiscence and re reviewing all my newsletters and writing out my expert system article. Well, that's sort of a walk down memory lane. It's pleasant, but it's nothing new. Now I'm doing this call with you. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm afraid I'm in, I've reached the, uh, the uh, reminiscence phase rather than the innovation phase. Um, the, I mean, the latest thing, I, I'm into bird watching and among things. I get up in the morning and I go out and it's exercise and keeps me alive. I go out and watch birds. And I've been just amazed by the degree to which bird watching has changed. I mean, I, I learned bird watching in high school and college and you used a book and a pair of binoculars and you walked around looking for birds. Um, and I've done bird watching on and off since then, but not so much when I've been busy with other things. Now that I'm back at it, I find that people don't use their books so much anymore. They grab their iPhone and go online to look. And when they get done looking at birds, they report the birds they've seen online to an application run by Cornell University called, uh, called eBird. Well, eBird, it's an amazing thing. eBird is like Wikipedia. There are hundreds of thousands of people a day who report the birds they've seen to eBird. eBird can give you a map and show you where all the the uh, robins in the United States are on, <laughs> as of yesterday. <laughs> well, they can do these, these elaborate migration maps that show you robins moving north, robins moving south by doing things like that. Uh, the bird identification application can look at 10 years of data from the site that you've located with your iPhone, which is the GPS, look at 10 years of data forwards and backwards from that day and tell you what birds you're likely to see. And so just learning, learning all the digital tricks, I, I think of it, I call it digital birding. Learning all the digital tricks is interesting. And I've actually started working on an article on digital birding, uh, which I'll probably publish on business process trends. But um, that's not much, but it's amusing. It keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for all this uh, reminiscing and sharing the, your stories and your journey. Um, my final question to you um, is, it, do you have any 
imparting words of wisdom or guidance for people that are coming in new to the field. And the, the field I'm thinking of is basically instructional design. So the program instruction of, of the past, and now it's, you know, learning and development, uh, e-learning, um, you know, taking advantage of all the digital technologies. But, but there's a, a, a history and a common core, I think, to you know, what that's all about, what that's for, what these are means to an end. And a lot of it has to do with process and all that stuff. But so for new people that are kind of coming into the field, what, what recommendations would you have based on, you know, your, your history and all of this? What guidance would you share with them? Sure. Um, whatever, whatever they start with, it's going to change. Um, don't get hung up on names. I, I mean, I've been a newsletter editor for 20 years and I get articles from people who have one word and you change that word and they write immediately and say, no, 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 it's, it's performance. It's not motivation. It's, uh, you know, et cetera. And if, you, if you're an editor and you watch different articles coming in from different places and changing with time, you know that there isn't any fixed word. The word word is going to vary from people and communities. And what you want to do is step back and choose the broadest term you can to, that people can agree on. I mean, it's, I, I did that as early as trying to get the Job Corps people to describe their classes the same way. Um, we, I, it's always been a problem with process. I, ISPI is, I mean, I tried to get ISPI involved in business process change. And I, I essentially set up a little department for it. I tried to solicit articles. I got columnists to write for it. Um, and I, as far as I can tell, I got next to no support from the NSPI community for that. Uh, we reached out a couple of times and didn't get anywhere, which was okay because IT is a much bigger community. Uh, business is a much bigger community. Uh, the process is a much bigger community. And we made a lot more money <laughs> talking process than we would have ever made talking performance. Uh, but from, if you're a performance person, what you ought to take from that is that the, 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 your career, the interesting opportunities are going to be with with the bigger approach, not the smaller approach. And I don't know how people get locked into being purists. You know, I'm only a program instruction person. I don't want to hear a motivation. Tom didn't want to hear about motivation. Uh, you know, um, it just, it limits you. It limits you, it limits your opportunities uh, and it limits the way you think about problems. Um, so for me, at least, I mean, it's all performance at some level, right? I mean, it's it, people have to do things. Even, even if you're almost completely automated, somebody has to tell the system what its goal is. That's got to be a CEO, you know, otherwise the system doesn't start. Nobody plugs it in. Uh, somebody, you've always got people, and people are going to always innovate and change. I mean, people's needs are what drives companies, not their products, after all. And so you need, you need to think about what are, what are people's changing needs? And only people do that. I, no, I don't know of any computer program I come up with that, that thinks that way, that w would think that way. Um, so if you're gonna get into a, a group like performance and uh, process, uh, sorry, I, too many of the same word. If you're gonna get into program instruction, be prepared to find out that in addition to program instruction, that if you want to solve real problems, you have to think about motivation. It's not just whether the person knows it, it's whether the manager provides support for their doing it that way. It's whether the company decides it wants to keep that division going or not. So you, you're gonna expand. You're gonna go from PI to motivation to calling all that performance and instruction uh, 
you're going to have computing. For a while, a lot of computing people came to ISCI because it was a place to learn about instruction on computing. But it didn't last. They went and set up their own organization somewhere else. Uh, and nowadays, if you want to write up to do it, you can't even do that. I mean, there, there, is, there is a computer instruction conference, but there are specialized conferences that do other things. I mean, I used to think performance and instruction has a conference every year. Uh, I was on the board of IEEE, Amer uh, Industrial Engineering and Electronics or something like that, for their conference board. They have a thousand conferences a year. They're all over the place. You know, they try, they're constantly looking for, you know, what is the next new hot thing that we should have a conference on and setting one up. Um, you know, that's, that's instructional technology. That's not, sorry, that, that's IT. Um, business has conferences all over the place. You know that something is winning when it, in an industry, when they stop meeting about, talk about the industry and the industry, the specialists start going out to particular business conferences. Uh, IT for banking, IT for insurance, IT for automotive. Um, so it, it's going to keep changing. It's going to keep growing, and it's going to keep getting more complex and interactive. You know, and if you want to have a career that's interesting, you want to keep keep moving, keep expanding. I mean, keep learning for sure, but but don't pin yourself down narrowly. Keep thinking about broader ways to do it. Um, I think I think that the in the mid '90s, ISPI I, I could have profited by piggy banking on business process trends and having a more active section there. They would have found work among IT people who were looking for people to help them do things with expert systems. Um, in the near future, AI. I mean, AI is. I mean, there were meetings in the mid. Uh, I don't know. Let's say 60s, 70s, probably, 80s. Let's say 80s, where I would go to ISPI and talk about cognitive, and there were still a whole hardcore group of behaviorists there who didn't want to hear about cognitive, as if somehow behaviorism was the beginning and the end of psychology. And it, it was passed by the 80s. I mean, behaviorism is never going to be passed in some ways. Bandura wrote a famous paper on cognitive versus behaviorism, and he pointed out that, that you know, probably 80% of behavior could be explained by behavioral principles, and it wasn't going to change, but that it wasn't where the action was at, you know. Yes, if you punish someone, they'll do it less. If you reward someone, they'll do more of it. But if you're trying to figure out instructional materials, I used to teach, try to teach math in, in the job course center. And at some point I read this wonderful paper that a cognitive person had written. There are 280 something rules for basic math. And they just line them right up. You know, how do you, what is one and two? You know, and how do you do a basic addition? How do you do an addition when one of the, when that takes you over nine, you know, and you have to carry and so forth. So, the, uh, you know, I used to try to figure that out indirectly when I was working with the kids in the math class. Now that I've seen somebody work it out systematically, I realize you could write a much more efficient course if you knew that in advance. So anyway, keep learning, learn new things, keep expanding your definition of the business you're in. I mean, if somebody pressed me today, I'd say I'm a writer and I'm a, I'm a management consultant. And I wouldn't try to pin it down less than that. I, I might say I specialize in business process, but I probably wouldn't even say that because I'm writing more articles on AI today than I am on business process. Well, Good luck. Thank you. thank you. Yeah. Well, Paul, thank you so much for spending this time with me today and, and sharing your, your stories of your journey and uh, that uh, parting uh, guidance, which is things are going to change and you need to stay current with that and don't get locked in and don't stay narrow. But uh, again, thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to continuing to uh, read uh, what you write for Business Process Trends. And I would encourage our audience to check out 
uh, the website and your newsletter, and I will put those uh, links in the show notes on the YouTube video. But thank you again so much and have a great day. Thank you. I enjoyed it.